My name is Zahara Nampio. I come from Uganda. I'm a lawyer. Uh, previous to coming to Emory, I was teaching at uh, the law school in Macquarie University, um, majoring in the areas of gender and the law, health and the law. I'm pursuing my SJD here at Emory Law School and working with the Feminist Legal Theory Project. And my area of research is on sexuality and uh, deconstructing the sexuality of powerful women. I've always been working with issues of gender and issues of women because I come from Uganda where, you know, it's a patriarchal society and, uh, you know, subordination of women is, an, is a day-to-day -day occurrence. But my first realization on the need to really delve into issues of sexuality was when I started teaching the course on gender and the law at Macquarie University Law School. This is a course that I didn't take during my undergraduate, but I, I became introduced to it when I was teaching. And there I looked at the, the impact of the law, the impact of religion, the impact of culture on women's equality, issues of you know, equity. And I became very much interested you know, in learning how could law be made better what could be done about it, and, and what was my place in there. And I was very much interested in, you know, working with students, uh, you know, learning from them and teaching them and sharing them generally about law, culture, religion, and what we could do to improve the lives of women. Um, also through my professional life, I worked with a number of civil society organizations, such as the Uganda Association of Female Lawyers. I worked with UNIFEM, which is the United Nations Development Fund for Women. And I also worked with the, the Danish International Development Agency. And in all this work, I was really looking at the women's angle, access to justice for women. For example, in Danida, uh, we supported two constitutional cases um, in, the, in the court, which challenged you know, uh, unconstitutional provisions in the law on property rights for women. An interesting one also was that which challenged uh, criminal adultery for women. Uh, for women, uh, adultery was sleeping with any, having sexual intercourse with any man. Whereas for men, it was having sexual intercourse with a married woman. So just challenging this inequality in the law and, and seeing that the law was changing, for me, brought out that realization, you know, the need to work more with the sexuality of women. Well, the relationship between sexuality and power is that when you look, you know, Loosely, uh, for sure, women don't seem to have power. Women in patriarchal societies seem to be powerless because of the way that you know, gender is constructed. The man is powerful, he's the one in the, in the public. And um, if you look at the construction of sexuality, the man is in control, sexuality is aggressive, it all revolves around the phallus. You know. Uh, but if you look carefully, closely underneath the surface, there's a lot of power underneath that women can negotiate. Um, there are a lot of women that have power, that are using the power positively. Uh, for example, uh, in, in local societies in Uganda, you have uh, the paternal aunts, you know, the, the, the aunts, the women that are related to girls and, and do have a lot of power over them, that teach them about sexuality. And you know, this is power that can be transferred from one woman to another. Um, we have traditional birth attendants. These are women that help other women to deliver babies. There's a lot of, of power that these women share with other. So of course, yes, there is seemingly a, a, a power relation between you know, sexuality and, and sexual and productive rights for women. But there is a lot of leeway for women to negotiate within the spaces. With regard to, to, to female sexuality, there are things that keep amazing you in everyday life. Of course, you, when you think about Patrick, you're thinking about the powerlessness, the, the woman as the victim. But there are many times that you know, women come to you and they tell you stories that really empower you. For example, you find married women that have suffered in, in relationships that are violent but then they find ways of, of seeking pleasure for themselves. You know, there are cases of 
uh, extramarital relationships. There, there are cases of, of, of different sexual orientations. You know, women come out with stories of, of survival. And you wonder, you know, these are things that ordinarily when you look at the woman, you wouldn't expect her to be like that. You find women that are veiled, Muslim women, and the stories that they tell you are, are quite controversial. Um, and then, uh, for example, in Africa, a lot of women uh, are circumcised. Others uh, uh, elongate the, the labia minora. That's the, the, the culture of elongating part of the, the genitalia, the female genitalia. And some women have actually gone against this. You know, they have contested the practice, and that is, uh, you know, quite um, uh, amazing. You know, it, it shows that women do actually have power, and they, they are using this power. Disempowered women, or you know, women generally, can do a lot to try and reverse the situation. You know, on, on, on enjoyment of their sexual and reproductive rights and their sexuality generally. If you look at the environment within which women enjoy their rights, it's, it's quite restrictive, especially in the African setting. Um, the law is very restrictive, the culture is very restrictive, the religion is very, very restrictive. Uh, for example, the Catholic religion does not allow the use of condoms, it does not allow the abortions. Same goes to culture, a woman should be you know, subordinate to her husband. Um, in, the, in the African culture, many African cultures, a woman cannot say no you know, to sex when her partner demands it. In the Maasai culture, there was the practice of a communal sharing of wives. When a man came to a woman's hut, she couldn't say no. You know, she had to say yes to every partner. So, of course, th there, are those, there are those issues. But what can the woman do about it? There's a lot that can be done at an individual level. At, um, at the societal level, at the institutional level. At the individual level, um, women activists in Africa have been, have been told that we are upsetting the status quo, we're making women come out of their homes and leave their husbands, and this is contributing to the divorce rates. But what uh, I, I and other activists advise women is that you try to negotiate within your boundaries and ensure that you're safe. What is it, what kind of power do you have to negotiate within your relationship? Can you advise your partner? Can you teach your partner? Can you carry your partner alongside you know, a training for women's rights? So individually, see how much you can negotiate. Talk to other women. There are so many power centers within the community. Traditional birth attendants, uh, mentors, and, and you know, political leaders. There's so much that, that can be harnessed. There are so many energies that can be harnessed. Share with other women. And then also look at the law. You know, th there are a lot of legal remedies in case you know, the worst comes to the worst and, and you actually, you know, th there's a threat of life. You know, seek the law, seek justice. So um, I think there's a lot that can be done. Of course, an individual woman may, may not have that much to do, but I think also as, as um, you know, activists, as, as external agents, um, I think we have a lot to do to help uh, women enjoy their sexual and productive rights, just teaching them about their rights and uh, advocating for you know, availability of institutions and infrastructure for them to enjoy their sexual and productive health and rights, I think is very important. Uh, the relationship between gender issues and human rights is that, well, gender is part of human rights. It's, you know, everybody should be respected. Um, Article 1 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says, you know, men and women are equal before the law. So uh, the understanding of gender is that there are social roles between men and women, which eventually turn out that, you know, women are not equivalent to men in, you know, in certain things. They are left to the private and the men are left to the public. But human rights are supposed to reverse this. Human rights are supposed to correct this. Of course, the, the challenge is that human rights are enjoyed within a, you know, a, a subjective environment. There's the cultural relativism. However, if, if rights were respected the way they needed to be respected, then of course there would be gender equality, there would be gender equity. So I think human rights are the vehicle that is required to ensure that there's gender equity between the two sexes. Mm -hmm. 
my first attraction or desire to be linked to the to Emory Law School and, and the, the Feminist Legal Theory Project, of course, was the, the individual, Professor Martha Feynman. Mm -hmm. I, I had read her works, I admired her works, and I admired her arguments. I, I am mesmerized by the way that she puts out her ideas. Her books are more in, you know, in line of stories, and I, I wanted to work with her. And the fact that I'd been working with women, and for me, sexuality is much more than a biological, a medical thing. It's more about expressions. It's those, you know, non-physical things that are rarely talked about. And, and Martha had put it out very clearly. So I wanted to be associated with the, the FLT project, and I wanted to work closely with Martha. Well, I want to give a voice to issues of sexuality. Sexuality in, in Africa, sexuality in Uganda is, is a taboo. It's something that is not spoken about. I want to, to break this barrier and be able to put out a, a, you know, a responsible discourse on issues of, of sexuality. I would like to publish. I would like to portray the woman not as a victim, but as a powerful being that can negotiate her sexuality that can engage, you know, can be part of agency on, on issues of sexuality. And of course, I'd like to publish, you know, my work. So that would be my main, um, you know, uh, the reason why I'm working here. I'd also like to just voice out and, and, and engage with others through conferences and workshops and be able to enrich my own perspective on, on issues of sexuality. First of all, I'd like to go back home and uh, set up the courses that I've found very interesting here. I'd like to, to set up a feminist legal theory course. In, in Macquarie University, we have gender and the law full stop. We don't have anything on sexuality, so I'd like to bring that in. Um, the legal regulation of intimate relationships is also something that's picking up in Uganda. Right now, Uganda is proposing a law against uh, homosexuality, so this is an issue that really needs to be tackled in Uganda at a responsible level, looking at the law, looking at practice. And I think we need to engage not through the media, but through you know, intellectualism, students that can actually think out you know, some, some issues. So I would like to go home and, and start up courses within the university on issues of sexuality. I'd like to publish. And I'd like to generally work more with the grassroots women you know, building their capacity, empowering them and sharing them with issues of, of, of sexuality. That's, that's what I'd, I'd really like to do. Um, I'd also like to expound more on, you know, the, the whole aspect of vulnerabilities. It's, it's new, it's something that I've found here at Emory, but that I'd like to take back home and see how does it fit within our context in Africa, in Uganda, how can we work with it? Because yes, we do have human rights back home. Maybe they're not working as well as they should be. But how, what else can we work with that might give us better results? So that's what I, I, I intend to do when, when I, I get back home. Another thing that women can, can do you know, to enhance their and other women's sexual and reproductive rights is, is to teach their children and to teach their sons especially. Because, you know, issues of sexuality, issues of gender start from the home. Many boys, you know, learn to be men right from the home. So I think women need to start teaching their sons about equality, equity, and sexuality. <laughs>